Android Kikaider is, well, the story of an android named Kikaider who fights an evil organization called Dark using his powerful electromagnetic attacks, his motorcycle, and his very fashionable jean jacket. This story has appeared in the form of multiple tokusatsu TV series, tokusatsu being a fancy term for Japanese live action that has heavy use of special effects. Think Sentai, Kamen Rider, Ultraman, stuff like that. There's also a manga, and even an anime that aired on Adult Swim. One persistent threat in these stories is Kikaider's brother, Hakaider. Hmm. The brother of the main android with a trademark whistle and a yellow scarf. This guy's Proto Man! Or rather, Proto Man is this guy. Same with Dark Man, design wise. Well, the movie we'll be looking at now is all about that guy. So let's see what the deal is with Mechanical Violator Hokkaider. Yes, that's what it's called. In the trailer, it was called Roboman Hokkaider, which is probably a more accurate translation, but it also sounds really silly. I don't know, take your pick. Hokkaider focuses on, well, Hokkaider, an amnesiac android who escapes from prison and heads to a sugar coated dystopia called Jesus Town. Yes, it's actually called Jesus Town. And clashes with its tyrannical ruler Gurdjieff and his right hand mandroid Michael. Along the way, he meets the rebel group populated by no name characters that don't really accomplish much and falls in love with one rebel named Kaoru, who believes Hakaider will be their salvation because her incredibly subtle dream tells her so. Yeah, I think the scene is trying to tell us something. I think there's some sort of symbolism here, but I can't tell. It's just too subtle. Also, I could be wrong about the whole falling in love bit. It's pretty strongly hinted at, but the dude only ever says like two things to her. It's just that sort of movie. Basically, the story is just set up for some cool looking scenery and fights. It's very much a style over substance affair. Luckily, Hakaider's style is pretty damn enjoyable. While it probably didn't have a huge budget, it delivers with what it's got. Keita Amemiya's designs always have a very distinct grittiness to them, and I think this movie showcases it well. Hakaider himself has a great suit in this movie, an update to the classic design that gives it a more distinctly 90s anti-hero brand of Edge, now sporting a permanent scowl instead of... whatever this face was. A brain that occasionally glows red? pointy Wario shoes, and an overpowered shotgun instead of a pistol. His rival Michael's armor and color scheme contrast well with Hakaider's by being equal parts angelic and menacing, all topped off by his one folded wing and his glowing claws. The Jesus Town soldiers' designs are charming too, they're really bulky which gives them this kind of endearing awkwardness. They also have these big long helmets with three light up eyes, which makes them seem a little more inhuman, so you don't mind seeing them get mowed down so much. Also, they're filled with feathers for some reason. Gurjev, the main villain, also has a pretty memorable getup. His clean looking all white outfit and bird skeleton accessory give him a somewhat angelic appearance, which is meant to contrast with his true nature. Also, he's filled with feathers for some reason. The rebel characters are more or less just dressed like typical dystopian bikers, but they're not what you're here for, and I think everyone involved knew that. The practical effects and backgrounds are pretty nice to look at too. The outer areas of Jesus Town are very post-apocalyptic and grungy in appearance, with Gurdjieff's building contrasting with it by having a sleek all-white design that matches his appearance. But beneath the white walls of the sanctum are messy looking red wires and tubes, and it gives the impression that the room itself is bleeding over the course of Michael and Hakaider's fight. Like everything else in the movie, it's not subtle at all. There's ham-fisted, and then there's this. This is more like Hakaider having two giant slabs of pork for hands, and he's running towards you as we speak to beat you to death with his ham fist. Oh sweet Jesus! Regardless, it makes for some really distinct and memorable scenery. There are some pretty hand-drawn backgrounds too. All the scenes of half-destroyed relics of past civilizations paired with vivid foregrounds would make for some sweet postcards if nothing else. The special effects are kind of a mixed bag. 
depending on which version you're watching. The practical effects overall are pretty dope. The feathers, the explosions, and the huge sprays of blood are all stylish. Even the corny stop motion is both charming and a little awkward. But the director's cut adds a bit of a modern touch to some scenes, and not in a good way. For example, when Michael and Hakaider have their fight, a ripple effect is edited in for every blow, which doesn't add any impact that the loud ringing sounds didn't already. Another unnecessary addition is a brief scene in which Hakaider activates his chess cannon that didn't make it into the theatrical cut. Which is cool in theory, and makes his glowing chest in an earlier scene make more sense. But it's portrayed with some awkward ass CGI that looks straight out of a 90s bowling alley. It's really jarring. In addition to those changes, the director's cut adds about 26 minutes onto the theatrical cut's runtime of 51 minutes. And it doesn't make great use of this added time for the most part. Generally, it just means that a lot of scenes run a little longer than they should in this version. But the director's cut does have a few things the theatrical cut doesn't. The intro has a much smoother transition between the Toei logo and the opening shot, which is a really minor thing but still worth mentioning, and a scene where Michael mourns the deaths of a squad of soldiers only to immediately murder the last surviving member does a great job of establishing what kind of character he is early on. Overall, the director's cut is a less enjoyable watch for me because a lot of it feels like fluff, but I enjoyed it nonetheless. The film's score is kind of just… fine for the most part. Most of it just kind of set the mood as much as necessary and then left my memory forever. There are three major exceptions, and one of them is what I assume was supposed to be the main theme of the movie. It's at least the most often used motif, but I'm not sure if it's memorable because it's actually good so much as it is because they play it a lot. The second major one is the music that plays during Hokkaido and Michael's fight. It sounds a bit sinister and features a choir, so it fits perfectly. And finally we have Wild Side, which plays during the end credits in the DVD menu. It's a relentlessly cheery sounding J-pop song that doesn't fit the tone of the movie at all, but damn if it isn't catchy. Overall, it's not intrusive or bad music, but it's not great either. The acting, and by extension the voice acting, also kind of just accomplishes what it needs to and not much more. None of the acting stuck out to me as remarkable. I guess Toei had the short script in mind during the casting process. Most of the actors haven't had too many roles other than this movie, or rather the actors who make a physical appearance haven't. The suit and voice actors kept themselves very busy both before and after this movie. You can definitely tell where the casting director's priorities lie. Much like the original language track, the English dub is… acceptable. Hakaider himself is voiced by Richard Epcar, who you might have heard as Bato in Ghost in the Shell, or Raiden in Mortal Kombat, and he does a perfectly fine job here as usual. It's not bad, but it's also not a performance that I'm going to remember for anything other than Hey, it's Richard Epcar. And everyone else is pretty fine too. It's not a remarkable dub, but if you're someone that absolutely refuses to read subtitles, you'll be fine here. Justice, this is what I do with it. I burn it. In flames. And how is the movie overall? Well, I'd say pretty good. While it's hard to take the ham-fisted symbolism and mostly flat cast of characters seriously, the movie still delivers in terms of entertainment value. And, well, entertainment value is still value. Now, as far as monetary value goes, you can find it on DVD for 20 to 40 US dollars, either individually or in the Keita Ame Mia collection. While 20 to 40 for one movie is a steep price for some, I'd say that price is a lot more reasonable for three movies, those other two movies being Moon Over Tao and Zerum 2. You might hear some more about those movies from me eventually. And no, I have no idea why they didn't include the first Zerum instead. Sadly, as of this video's release, I haven't found any legal streaming sites that have this movie available. 
Overall, Hokkaido is a fun way to kill less than two hours, and I recommend it. Alright, here we are at the end of another video. Sorry that took so long, I've been pretty busy over the course of the holidays. I was working on something in October and it didn't really work out. I'll probably retool it and release it as something later on in the year, maybe. But anyways, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Hopefully the next one won't take so long.